Karlsruhe in Baden. It was a small town, about 240,000 people living there. It was a university town. It was a very lovely town to live in, to be raised in. School was all right. We were about 36 children in one classroom. In school we were treated like the other ones. And we were two Jewish children. Anti-Semitism, it was always there. Since I can remember, since I was about 12, 13 years old, that I understand a little bit about anti-Semitism. In school you felt it already. But as a child you didn't take it serious. You had friends, and you really, I mean, you lived a normal life. Once in a while you heard dirty Jew, you know, if somebody wanted to be very mean, some children, they called you dirty Jew. But we, if you are a child, you don't take it serious. And that was when I was a little older, about 1928, 29, there I felt already, you know, that something is going on, but we still didn't take it serious. You saw it in every day's life, you saw it little by little, that something went on. Uh, Hitler said, you know, Christian people shouldn't work for Jews. You couldn't get anybody anymore to uh, be in your house, you know, as a housekeeper. But you still didn't believe that anything will come out of it. Because Jews were living in Germany for many hundred years. We, we realized 1933 already. They lost friends. They didn't want to be friends anymore. They didn't want to be seen with you. 1934, when Hitler came to power, then of course, you now help folklore news. They smashed sometimes stores. People who were very uh, well known, who had big positions, were dragged through the streets in trucks and spit on and hit. I saw it once going down the main street, you know, with my sister, and I ran into a house and I cried because we knew that people, they were very respected people and we just couldn't believe that that's possible. And from that moment on, every day something new came and we, we didn't come out from one thing into the other because it was a terrible time. One day in 1934, my father went in the evening for a stroll with a friend and he came home all excited. Somebody told them, you dirty Jew, and start hitting him. And they started to run. The friend went home and my father went home. And when he came home, he was white as a sheet. And he told us, you know, we didn't know what happened. And he said he was hit from some guys on the street. And they told them, dirty Jews, get out of Germany. So he said, that's it. I don't see any future here, not for me and not for my children. I'm not going to live in a country where I'm not wanted. But my father, he came from Poland in 1911 to Germany, and he just felt, he went that through in Poland once in a smaller way, and he felt that he doesn't want to go through that again. So he decided to leave Germany, and he did in July 1934, right after I was married. I married 1934 in June. He left four weeks later with my two sisters to Palestine. All our friends who lived in the same town thought my father was crazy to go because they all figured that maybe in a few months the whole thing is going to be blown over. You know, it can't be, it's impossible. Uh, a land and a, a country like Germany where they were very intelligent and everything was very precisely and the world was, you know, it was impossible to believe that something like that can happen. And the one who lived there for, for 200 years, the, the parents and grandparents and grandparents, they just didn't want to believe that something could happen like that. We were the next three years still in Germany, in Stuttgart, 
And then we came to our customers who were mostly Gentile Germans. They said in a very nice way, sometimes, you know, I'm sorry, but don't come the next time because we cannot buy from you anymore. You are Jewish, the firm you are working for is Jewish, we are not going to buy from Jews. And little by little we lost, we lost our accounts and our existence there. We are finished. Of course, we couldn't go to open places, you know, we couldn't go to a, a, a cafe house because they would stand up and yell high little, and we didn't do that. And if we didn't do that, we were, uh, you know, we were threatened that we, they could do some harm to us, so we didn't go. We, we felt, you know, we still felt maybe it's going to, to be better, but as time went on, we saw that it was no, no place to stay. In November 1938, when they round up all the German men to take him in prison and send him to Dachau, they also was looking for my husband. He hided with a friend in the attic in our house. And when she came and asked for him, my mother now said that he's out of town and he's going to come back a day or two later. So she told them, you know, there were two SS men. They said, if he's not going to come tomorrow back, we are going to come and take his wife and his child. By that time, I had a little baby six months old. And in the night time when my husband came down from the attic, you know, we, told, we had to tell him that. So he said, now it's finished. I cannot, I cannot stand it longer. He and his friend, the day later, he went down. We were living in Cannstatt. It was a little town next to Stuttgart. And he went to Stuttgart to the SS and he, he gave himself up. His friend, who was a veteran from the First World War, he had a very low voice and they told him to talk louder. And he said he can because he was in shop in the F First World War. And when he said that, they, they hid him so that he couldn't get up anymore. And my husband saw that. They took him into the prison. But the same evening, a guy passed through who was also an SS and he played football with my husband when he was a young guy. He recognized him and he said, what you are doing here? So my husband said, I don't know. They took me in because I'm Jewish. So he said, wait a minute. So he left and he came back and he said, could you leave Germany in a few days? So my husband said yes. I mean, he would have said yes to everything just to come out of the prison. Because he knew that he was sent away the next day to Dachau. So he said yes. And so they gave him eight days to leave Germany. He had a good friend, he was a teacher. And his wife gave birth to a child. And the child was maybe six months old. And he had another little child, two years. And he didn't have a chance to leave Germany. He had nobody in another country who would give him, you know, a help to get out. So he said, that's it. And one morning he was found dead in his apartment with his wife and the two children into poison. And I never forget when we sank down stairs where he where they took out four baskets, two small ones and two big ones. And it was a tragedy. We called a cousin of ours in England and we cried on the phone because we knew if we cannot prepare, if we cannot show papers the next week, that we would have been sent to a camp. Lucky enough, that cousin in England had, could provide us with papers that the English consulate could give us a visa the next week to leave for England just for a while till we became our entrance to America. 
because we were on a quota, on a German quota, and that took months and months and months till we would get the entrance to America. So we left our house with a baby, six months old, in December 31, from Stuttgart, and we went by train to Dover. What did the belongings, what belongings did you take with you? I could nothing take along than the suitcases we were, we could carry. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that suitcases had to be checked a few days before. They take in a big hole where SS men were standing and checked the cases so that nothing is in there that we took along. We were not supposed to take money along and nothing, just an German Reichsmark. Now, now, when you were in that hall... So, I, uh, my husband and my father-in-law went with me, but they were standing outside. I went into the hall to be checked out. And I, at home, I figured I didn't say anything, but I took a couple of hundred dollar bills and folded it very small together in my pocket. And I thought, 